morning, everyone. Thank you, Rob. Um, thank you all for joining us. Like all of you, no doubt, I have always been fascinated by the topic of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And who better to talk to us about that today than Professor Ed Watts at the University of California at San Diego. Professor Watts was born in Princeton, New Jersey. He received a BA in classics from Brown University and his PhD in history from Yale University. His research interests center on the intellectual, political, and religious history of the Roman Empire and the early Byzantine Empire. He is the author of six books and the editor of five more. His most recently published book is Mortal Republic, How Rome Fell into Tyranny. And that book offers a narrative history of the last three centuries of the Roman Republic. This summer, he will publish Rome's Eternal Decline and Fall, the history of a dangerous idea, a book that traces the 22 year history of claims about Roman decline, strategies for Roman renewal, and how one can talk productively about a society's recovery from crisis. With that, please join me welcoming Professor Ed Watts. Over to you, Ed. Thank you so much, Clark. Thank you, Rob. Um, thank you, Sarah. And, and thank you everybody for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all today. Uh, Today, I'm going to tell the story of a revolution that changed the Roman world. So I'm going to start my share for my screen right now. Um, so the, the story of the fall of the Roman Republic begins with a revolution in finance that sparks massive wealth inequality <clears throat> and catalyzes political dysfunction in an old and extremely successful representative democracy. Now this story of course probably sounds familiar to us because we could be talking about France or the US or the UK in the 21st century, but instead I'm gonna take us back 2200 years to the height of the Roman Republic. And as we'll see the situation in Rome in the second century BC is somewhat similar to what we now find in the great Western representative democracies. And in Rome, what we see is a combination of wealth inequality and political dysfunction eventually doomed the Republic. We can avoid that fate, but only if we learn from Rome. But it's perhaps best to begin with a basic point. The Roman state that most of us know is the Roman Empire. And Rome was one of history's most successful empires. So nearly 1500 years elapsed from the reign of Augustus, Rome's first emperor, to the empire's end following the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople in 1453. And so to put that in perspective, an empire that began in the age of sandals and swords ended amidst barrages of Turkish cannon fire. Few other states in history endured that long. But before Rome was an empire, Rome was a republic. And it was one of the longest lived and most successful republics in history. So the Roman Republic endured for nearly 500 years. It began as the government of a small city state, not much bigger than um, the District of Columbia. And when it died, Rome's Republic controlled nearly the entire Mediterranean. This gives you a sense of what we we're talking about. Um, this is an area about the size of the modern United States. And all are part of more than 40 modern countries were controlled by Rome. And this is everywhere from the Sudan to Russia, from Saudi Arabia to Germany. In the end, perhaps a quarter of the entire population of the world lived under Roman control at that moment. And so to put that in perspective, a quarter of the world population now is, a set, is essentially adding the populations of India and China together. Now, most of the expansion that made Rome into this massive empire uh, and this massive territorial conglomeration occurred during the second and first centuries BC. And it happened in large part because Rome's Republic worked very well for a very long time. And perhaps nothing shows this better than how Rome handled the threat posed to it by its most famous adversary, the Carthaginian general Hannibal. Now Hannibal was of course the greatest commander that Rome's rival Carthage ever produced. And when war with Rome broke out in 218 BC, Hannibal shocked the Romans by marching out from his base in Spain, crossing the Alps and invading Italy. And then once in Italy, Hannibal won three quick military victories in 218, 217, and 216 BC. More than 100,000 Roman soldiers died just in those three years. And this is a sum greater than the total number of Americans who've been killed in combat since the end of World War II. 
And this is, to put this in perspective, despite the fact that the American population now is about 80 times larger than that of Rome in the third century BC. And so by 216 BC, Hannibal was a day's march from the city of Rome. And it's at this moment that the Roman Republic showed its true strength because Rome had lost perhaps 35% of its population of fighting age men just in those three years. It was nearly bankrupt and it faced a revolt by many of its Italian allies. But Rome nevertheless resolved to confront Hannibal. And so Romans flocked to assemblies, they voted on commanders, and they endorsed policies that ensured that Rome would fight until Hannibal was defeated. Romans and the men they elected to represent them embarked on a military campaign and an economic mobilization unlike anything the world had ever seen. Fully 70% of the remaining Roman men of military age enlisted in the army. Troops were sent to fight in Spain, France, Croatia, Albania, Greece, Tunisia, and Algeria. And the Roman economy shifted to one in which civilian needs were deliberately not met, including basic food needs, so that war materials could be produced. And for almost 15 years, the Roman civilian population willingly endured food and material shortages, as well as the ongoing death and destruction inflicted by Hannibal's army that remained in Italy for 13 years. But Romans remained resolutely supportive of their decision to fight on. And this is because they were part of a republic. Because unlike classical Athens, Rome was not a democracy. And it, this is one of my favorite slides because it shows in very visual senses uh, the difference between Athenian democracy and the Roman Senate. Athenian democracy was something in which all voters counted equally and all decisions were made on the basis of a popular vote of citizens. And this is the space uh, on the left. This is the space in which those Athenian citizens came together. And all of them voted by raising their hands. The votes were counted. And a majority of voters decided what the policy would be. But Rome didn't work this way. Not all votes counted equally in Rome. And voters did not make or decide policy completely on their own. Instead, they elected representatives to make and implement policy. And the Roman Senate House, which you see on, on the right, this is the space in which we can imagine representative democracy taking place. Because the Roman policy is made in such a fashion uh, that every Roman voter elects magistrates who are supposed to represent the views of the widest possible group of constituents. And so voters then elect people who come together uh, and propose laws and make decisions uh, that the voters then have the ability to agree with or disagree with. And this happens in a controlled space. So instead of all citizens coming together to make a decision and a narrow majority taking, um, holding the day and winning that vote, in the Roman context, representatives came together in a controlled space and they spoke for the large group of Roman people. But the Republic worked on the principle that every action then needed to be taken on the basis of consensus. Because third century Romans felt that as a representative democracy, it was important to build a wider consensus than a narrow majority would necessarily permit. And this made them uh, create and make decisions that large numbers of Romans, super majorities of Romans supported. And once Rome decided on something like this, large segments of the population then owned the decision and they owned its outcome. They were invested in the policy that they all had helped put together and craft. And so when they decided to fight on until they defeated Hannibal, that was a decision made collectively. And it was a decision that everybody uh, in the Roman populace had endorsed. Now this resolution to continue fighting Hannibal is admirable, but as Americans well know, when a Republic embarks on a war like that and they fight around the world, it's often difficult for that Republic to then pull back. And this was true of Rome too. Uh, after Hannibal and the Carthaginians were defeated in 202 BC, Rome tried repeatedly to withdraw troops from Greece, Spain, Africa, and Asia Minor. And over the next 50 years, we see a sequence of Roman interventions followed by Roman withdrawals. But each time Rome was forced to come back to fight in that area, the terms it inflicted on the defeated became harsher until finally, one by one, Rome's enemies lost their independence as the Republic lost patience. 
and decided that it was better for Rome to directly control those areas than it was to continue to intervene and withdraw. And so Rome soon found itself holding lands that spanned three continents, and the Republic now owned an empire. Now, the Roman Republic took a thoroughly modern approach to running this empire because the Republic did not want to build out a bureaucracy to control the empire. Instead, what they did was they contracted out the administration of Rome's new provinces. And they did this in a very interesting way. Investors bid on contracts to run these provinces, to collect taxes. And we, of course, know from the New Testament how tax collection worked in these provinces. Um, but when investors bid on these contracts, the Republic required them to pay the full cost of the contract up front. And so a tax collector would say that they could collect a certain amount of revenue from, say, Asia Minor. Uh, they would then get that contract. They would front all of the revenue they promised. They would then go to Asia Minor. And if they collected more, that was their profit. And so a contractor bidding to collect all of the taxes in a province would pay the entire sum up front and then set off to recoup his investment with the additional taxes collected as his profit. Now, this arrangement inadvertently spurred a financial revolution in Rome because no bidder had the cash on hand to cover the entire tax burden of the province of Asia. The province of Asia for Rome was basically one third of the modern nation of Turkey. And this was true of most of the other contracts that came up for bid as well. So successful bidders had to take out loans to cover their costs. And the loans would be paid back following the end of the contract with interest and possibly a portion of the profits that the tax collector made. But what Romans quickly realized was that these loans themselves could be assessed a value based on the likelihood the loan would be repaid and the amount of additional income it would generate. And the Roman innovation was to see that a price could be set for the resale of large loans that had a calculable value. And so reselling a loan would recapitalize the lender and he or she could then make another loan very quickly, which he or she could then again sell to generate more investment capital. And by the 150s BC, savvy Romans who understood these financial instruments became wealthier than any Roman had ever been before. And to put this in, pers in perspective, the richest man in Rome in 190 BC was Scipio Africanus, the general who defeated Hannibal. His fortune tipped the scales literally at 700,000 denarii, the four gram Roman co silver coin that formed the basis of the Roman monetary system. And I say literally because his fortune was literally held in physical form. It was in cash and property. But the financial revolution changed this. So if we move a little more than 100 years into the future, the richest man in Rome was Crassus. Uh, and Crassus had a fortune in the 70s BC that topped 42.6 million denarii, more than 60 times that of Scipio. But very little of this would have been in cash. In fact, it would have been impossible for it to be in cash because the denarius is four grams of silver. And this meant that Crassus's holdings would have weighed more than 175 tons, likely more than all of the coined silver in the Roman economy at that time. So instead of a pile of cash, Crassus had a remarkably diverse investment portfolio. So he lent money to tax collectors. He lent money to people bidding on mining work. He even lent money to ambitious politicians like Julius Caesar. He bought other loans that people had made, and he owned extensive farms and agricultural properties. And Crassus also had a major stake in the apartment buildings that had sprung up in the rapidly growing city of Rome. And he particularly liked to flip properties. So he had a staff of engineers, architects, and craftsmen who could help him do this. And all of this new wealth fueled a rise in conspicuous consumption. So grand villas were constructed along main roads. Uh, lavish dinner parties were held that featured things like ostrich steaks and flamingo tongues. And stories began to circulate about the nouveau riche doing things like dissolving pearls in vinegar so that they could quite literally drink their wealth away. Now, there's an important thing to understand about this. Many of the people who did this sort of thing could afford it. And many of the people who did this sort of thing had earned their money legally. And so this isn't criminal behavior. But these displays of wealth were dangerous, not because they were criminal, but for another reason, because the conspicuous consumption occurred while Rome's middle classes saw its economic prospects stagnate. So the first half of the second century BC had seen both the Roman rich and the Roman middle class do well. Like Europe after World War II, 
Italy needed to rebuild its population and its infrastructure after the devastating war with Hannibal. And the first two generations born after 200 BC had lots of opportunities to get land cheaply, build markets for their products, and find work in cities. And so the rich were getting richer, but the middle class was doing very well too. And so everybody shared in the economic growth fueled by Roman expansion and prosperity. But the economic tide stopped lifting everybody's boats in the 140s BC. The Roman rich continued to get richer, but with Italy now rebuilt, the economic opportunities for poor and middle-class Romans began to dry up. And so after two generations in which children could expect to be richer than their parents, the Romans coming of age in the 140s BC realized that in all likelihood, they would be poorer than their parents. Now they wouldn't be starving. These were not people who were falling into absolute abject poverty, but these people would not do as well as they had hoped or expected. And these Romans knew that the, that the Roman wealthy continued to get richer. They could see their villas, they heard stories about their wasteful spending, and they felt angry. And now this is the moment where we see one of the challenges republics face, because the republic struggled to respond to this situation. And it's a very profoundly difficult situation to address, because on the one hand, you do have people getting extravagantly wealthy. Uh, but they're doing it legally. And so the Republic doesn't have legal grounds to take that money away. But at the same time, the Republic has to address the economic uncertainty and the frustration that everyone else is feeling. And so the Republic that works on the basis of consensus and compromise needs to find a way to compromise uh, in a fashion that acknowledges the legitimacy of the wealth the wealthy people have, but also acknowledges the larger concerns that most other Romans have. And the Republic struggled to do this. And so we see a series of half measures proposed across the 140s. So politicians talked about sending some Romans out as colonists to new lands that were conquered in Northern Italy. They proposed tweaking laws that allowed the public to farm public land. Uh, but popular discontent was rising too quickly for the Republic's slow, deliberate, and consensus-based political process to keep up. And as the 130s dawned, a new generation of politicians came of age. And so they saw political opportunity for themselves amidst this popular discontent. They began championing a series of voting rights laws that made it possible for Romans to vote by secret ballot. But then with secret balloting possible, these populists began pushing for economic reforms uh, with the most prominent of them being a man named Tiberius Gracchus. Now, Tiberius Gracchus was in some ways an extremely cynical politician. He was the member of an elite family who embraced populism as a way to rebuild his political fortunes when he'd suffered a political reverse. Now, he was a reformer, but he was a reformer motivated primarily by the pursuit of personal power. And so on the one hand, Tiberius's policy proposals to address this discontent were relatively moderate. What he wanted to do was take public lands that wealthy farmers were leasing and give poor Romans some of the land that comprised the largest of these farms. And he also promised to compensate the farmers who currently lease the land for its loss. Now, this was not a radical proposal, but what Tiberius was doing in a sense was pushing Rome to respond aggressively, not in a way that represented substantive political and policy choices, but instead catered to the emotions that people felt in a situation where their desires and demands were frustrated. And the approach Tiberius took, of course, generated a backlash. He could not build consensus to back his reform, not so much because the reform was flawed, but because his approach was something that was deliberately aggravating uh, Roman political divisions. And so backed by angry crowds, Tiberius Gracchus deposed a magistrate who had blocked implementation of his plan and then he redirected public funds to pay for the surveyors his plan required. Now these moves are not illegal, but they were unprecedented. And more importantly, what Tiberius had done was recognize the power that popular discontent had. And he substituted threats and intimidation backed by this emotion in the populace for compromise and consensus building that had normally dominated the way the Republic made decisions. Then Tiberius announced that he was planning to run for re-election to an office that Romans usually held only once. 
This too was not illegal, but it was unprecedented. Now it's important to emphasize that Tiberius Gracchus never used physical violence to push through his new laws or back his election campaign, but his actions still alarmed opponents enough that they feared he might eventually resort to violence. And the line between threats and actual violence as we've learned in our country is sometimes quite thin and easily crossed. Uh, so Tiberius's opponents thought that he might actually use and capitalize upon this popular discontent to take over the Roman state. And so a few of them decided to block Tiberius before he had the chance. They armed a mob of their own supporters and they attacked Tiberius while voting for his election was actually underway. And so they attacked the voting site and Tiberius and a number of his backers were killed. Now this was the first act of political violence in Rome in over 300 years. And Romans desperately wanted to believe that this attack was an aberration. It wasn't. The Republic would survive for another century, but Tiberius Gracchus's murder had irreparably damaged Roman political life because Romans had learned that political norms could be broken if a policy seemed important enough to an individual politician and a population within the Roman body politic was angry enough about an issue to allow this. And threats, intimidation, and violence had all now become political tools that could be deployed to make law or overturn an election when no compromise could be found. The last century of the Roman Republic saw Romans repeatedly look away as Roman political life slowly but progressively degenerated into multi-year cycles of legislative gridlock that were broken only when Romans voted overwhelmingly for politicians who promised to do something, anything, to solve long neglected problems. And then often when these populists overreacted and overreached, their opponents responded violently. And so this cycle of political dysfunction became increasingly destructive each time it reset. And each time it reset, Roman politicians learned from the mistakes of the people who came before them and learned how to wield these tools of intimidation, violence, and division ever more effectively. And it ended only when Rome fell into the devastating sequence of civil wars in the 40s and 30s BC that killed the Republic and enabled Augustus, Rome's first emperor, to take power as an autocrat. And we know this is the end of the story, but we seldom think about whether that end could have been avoided. And I think it could, because Rome's Republic took a very long time to die and the crises that killed it were spread out considerably. So the average Roman lived to be about 50 years old, assuming he or she made it out of infancy. And that meant that they probably saw only one serious political crisis in their adult life. And when that crisis was resolved, they went back to their lives. And Romans with this sort of life experience could be forgiven for thinking that Rome had overcome an acute political crisis and that the Republic was strong again when that crisis was overcome. But the slow pace of Roman political degeneration didn't mean there was no degeneration. It just meant that it happened slowly enough that Romans failed to see it and their failure bred a fatal complacency. Now, Romans failed to stop these cycles of political dysfunction because they didn't imagine their republic could die. And no single person or choice destroyed the Roman Republic. It was much too robust for that. But the individual Romans who chose not to punish political obstruction or reckless populism or intimidation steadily eroded the Republic's integrity. And their unwillingness to hold bad actors to account stripped the Republic of its capacity to police behavior or protect or protected citizens. And so robbed of its institutional defenses, the Republic could not ultimately present or prevent Rome's descent into civil war or stop the emergence of a Roman autocracy. So where does that leave us? Well, many of the conditions that set up the demise of the Roman Republic are present in our world. We too are living in a time when a gap has opened between the wealthiest people in the West and those in the middle class and frustration is rising. Now, Rome shows us that these threats to representative democracy are real and very serious, but history is not destiny. And this presents us with both a challenge and an opportunity. So first, the challenge. Rome is, of course, a very different society from ours. And this makes it hard to convey the lessons of the past without falling into the trap of suggesting that history is repeating itself. But that doesn't mean we should stop using the past to understand the present. So we may not be Rome, but Rome's Republic does have important lessons to teach us. 
First, Roman history suggests that mature, established republics like ours take time to fall. They don't collapse quickly, but instead they often gradually succumb to cycles of crises that last a long time. And that means we should not necessarily see our current political moment as a sudden and acute crisis. It's instead another manifestation of longstanding political issues. So after the death of Tiberius Gracchus, the later Republic experienced violent political conflict roughly once or twice a generation. We now see this as a long process of degeneration, but the people living through these moments of conflict saw them as acute, isolated political crises. It took more than half a century for Roman thinkers like Cicero to realize that the actions of Tiberius Gracchus had been something different. They'd catalyzed a decades long process of political decline and crisis. But even here, even then, Cicero and many of the Romans like him who recognized this still looked away when it was convenient to do so. And so we can learn from them that the vigilant protection of norms is necessary at all times, not just when our side of the political divide is being wronged. The Roman experience though also suggests something else. It suggests that we step back and take a longer view of recent American history. So when did the crisis in American democracy actually begin? Michael Tomaski places its roots in the 1980s, when the rise of Rush Limbaugh, the televised performances of Newt Gingrich, and the demise of the Fairness Doctrine inaugurated this age of performative pardons, partisanship. But we could easily push the timeline back to the 1960s and see our conflicts arising from unresolved, persistent issues of racism, political violence, and disenfranchisement that we can see easily um, growing out of things in the 1960s. But my colleague, Mark Hendrickson, who's an economic historian of the US, has even mentioned to me that the relatively equal wealth distribution of the post-war economy is beginning to look so anomalous that we may eventually see this as a blip that temporarily obscured fundamental economic inequality in an industrialized America. Now, if he's true, if what he's saying is true, Romans would understand because they too had their own half century blip when all boats rose together after Hannibal's defeat. And we know it's a blip because nothing quite like that occurred again in the 15 subsequent centuries of Roman history. So Rome then suggests that our historical lens needs to be bigger to appreciate the dynamics of this moment. And historians know this, but many non-historians do not, and this can have consequences. So if Americans imagined that the uh, reign or the regime of Donald Trump was something that we should understand by comparing it to political developments in the 1930s, we may also think that now that Donald Trump is not president, uh, the current moment will dissipate and we will return to something resembling normal. And so whatever happens next, people will assume that a phase of our history is finished and they might turn, our, turn their attention elsewhere. But this is a mistake that so many millions of Romans made in the first century BC. It's what made them relax their vigilance when their republic seemed to be healthy. And Rome shows where that leads. It also shows us the need to fight for our republic if it's something we valued, and the need to fight for it in a principled way. So the Roman Republic died because generations of Romans took its survival for granted. But modern republics can be saved if citizens realize that their republic can die, and then fight to make sure that the republic does not. And that fundamentally is a struggle that I think we all can benefit from engaging in. So I, I thank you for that. Uh, and I will stop the share right now. Ed, that was terrific. Thank you so much. As you would imagine, we've got lots of questions. So I'll start with one kind of granular one. Speaking of uh, Tiberius Ruckus, um, his, land his land redistribution scheme, was progressive taxation also considered and tried as a way to deal with the wealth inequality issue? Uh, so this is a very interesting question because in the third century BC, one of the issues the Roman state faced was that it did have taxation of its citizens as a way to fund wars. And there was resistance to this, especially among um, lower class Romans because they were weary of paying for wars that didn't seem like they would end. So what the Republic actually did was they abolished taxation of Roman citizens um, in Italy. And so Italian citizens of Rome didn't actually pay taxes. Uh, instead, what they did was they built out this structure to tax people abroad to fund the state uh, and basically forgave taxes on, on all Italians. 
Um, it was a political decision to do it. It was in a sense, a way to make the state less accountable to regular Romans who didn't wanna pay for these things. Um, but it, what it did also was it eliminated the ability to do a progressive taxation or redistribution scheme. Uh, instead, when you see the development of social welfare schemes in Rome in like the 120s BC, this is all funded by revenue that's coming from abroad. Uh, and so it's all filtered through this taxation system of sending out tax collectors to basically um, bid on contracts. And then that money goes back to fund uh, resources and, and food distributions and other things for people in the city of Rome. Got it. Can you talk a little bit about Christianity during this period and what impact, if any, it had on the ultimate decline of Rome? So I think with the Republic, of course, we're before uh, Jesus. Um, but when we move into the Roman Empire and we, we look at the role of Christianity plays, um, there's a very interesting shift in the way Romans talk about their history and talk about their state that occurs following the conversion of Constantine. Um, there emerges for the first time in Roman history, a language of progress uh, and a story that Romans are telling about their state um, that is very different from how Romans have discussed things in the past. So Rome for basically for almost a thousand years before Constantine always had a kind of backwards looking view where the, the state was and the Romans were more virtuous, uh, always at some wonderful point in the, the deep past. And Rome had always fallen from this virtuous moment. And what Constantine said was, uh, in essence, we are moving towards something better. Christianity represents something we can aspire to be that is a state that is better than we have ever been before. And the language that Constantine uses is this idea of uh, there was once a, a, once a singular supreme God and everybody knew this. And over time, states fell away from this. They lost the understanding of that supreme God. Uh, and what Constantine believed Christianity did was it enabled Romans to go back to this kind of very basic and true idea of what divinity was. And so across the fourth century, for the first time in Roman history, you have a narrative of progress that Christians are pushing, saying that our society is becoming better than it has ever been before. Uh, and that's something that I think fundamentally shifts the way Romans engage with these questions. Um, how do you understand your society when you're always looking backwards? Well, you're, you're always in a sense looking for frames of reference for problems that don't exist in, or didn't exist, but now do. And what Constantine and the, the fourth century Christian leaders, uh, both in the church and outside of the church were saying is, we can look forward and we can imagine our society in a completely new way that will be better than anything that came before. Um, and some of the institutions they created, um, like a, a universal distribution of food across the empire through bishops and through church structures, they really did improve conditions for people um, because of this vision that they had. And it's a vision that was fostered by the embrace of Christianity. Interesting. Did the environment climate change play any role in the ultimate decline of the empire? Um, this is interesting because there is an argument that uh, has been made recently that says that we have evidence of a volcanic eruption that occurs um, in the 40s and 30s BC. Um, we do see some moments uh, where these things correlate. Um, and so we do see that there are issues with food supply in Rome that may have been caused by climate change uh, and may have facilitated some of the things that happened in that final civil war in the 30s and 40s. Uh, but there is one spectacular example during the um, third century, during the war with Hannibal, where the Republic basically uh, has lost access to its, some of the grain supplies that it had counted upon to feed its population. And it appeals to Egypt to do this. And Egypt is the great kind of, it is in a sense, uh, as Saudi Arabia is to oil, Egypt was to grain in antiquity. If there's a problem with supply, Egypt can provide the excess uh, grain, but not in the two tens, because there was very clearly a volcanic eruption that had knocked out and shifted the way that um, rain patterns in Africa were occurring. And so the Nile did not flood for a few years in Egypt in the 210s, and it didn't have excess grain supply. Uh, and so Rome appeals to Egypt for grain and Egypt has to effectively say, we don't have it. Uh, what they do instead is they send a bunch of gold to Rome and say, hey, <laughs> go buy grain somewhere else. The grain doesn't exist. Uh, and so you do see moments where 
um, we can see acute climate crises affecting political dynamics in, in the Roman world. Um, Rome, though, in the Republic is adaptive enough that it can respond to these issues in a way that, again, builds consensus and prevents real problems from emerging. In Egypt in the 210s, the regime almost falls. In Rome in the 210s, the Republic is strong enough that despite fighting a war and having shortages of food, it's able to still sort of maintain its political integrity. And so I think that, that's actually one of the great lessons that we see. We do see climate shocks. We do see pandemics. We do see all of these crises that we're now sort of very fundamentally aware of affecting the dynamics in our world and in our states. Um, Rome encountered all of those things. But for most of Roman history, the state was strong and resilient enough that those crises did affect the population really dramatically. But the state was able to respond and build a communal response that brought people together uh, and encouraged them to find solutions without victimizing others or blaming others for these crises. And I think that's probably the, the best lesson we can take away from Rome. I mean, these things can doom a society, uh, but they can also make a society stronger. Question from uh, one of the audience members is, what's your evaluation on Gibbon's rise and fall? Uh, so this is, this is excellent. So the, um, the interesting thing that Gibbon does uh, is he shifts the story of what Roman history is and where the peak of Roman history is. So if you look at a lot of the thinkers going all the way back to people like Sallust in the first century BC, the story of Roman decline is always Roman freedom. You know, when the Republic falls, this begins the decline of Rome. And what Gibbon says is no. I mean, Gibbon, of course, is living under the British monarchy and he's living in this European environment where there are kings all over the place. And he actually, you know, he's prior to the French Revolution. He actually believes that that moment in the 18th century is an incredibly stable moment. Um, he doesn't know what's coming. I mean, he finishes in 1788, 1789, of course, that whole thing blows up. But Gibbon believes that monarchy is what produces stability. And so Gibbon's great move is to say, you know what, the Republic actually didn't matter. Rome was better under the emperors, under the early emperors, than it was under the Republic. And so Gibbon shifts the story from the greatness of Rome is the Republic to the greatness of Rome is the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Uh, it is the imperial structure when the empire is working best, but hasn't become Christian yet. And so this has actually very fundamentally, I think, shifted the way all of us think about Rome because prior to Gibbon, people like um, Leonardo Bruni or Machiavelli or Montesquieu, they believed that the peak of Rome was the Republic, not the empire. And Gibbon's corrective, I think, has in a way kind of obscured for us the really significant thing that most people before Gibbon believed. Rome's greatness was as a free society. And the empire is in a sense, um, the hangover from the loss of that free society. What about the role of, of slavery during the course of the empire? So slavery um, is something that very dramatically affects Roman economic life, uh, especially as you move into the first century BC. Um, so in the second century BC, Rome is still, it, it is a slave society, um, but the large scale sort of chattel slavery and plantation style slavery uh, that we, uh, you know, from Spartacus and other places associate with Rome, um, that's really a first century BC phenomenon, and it continues through the empire. Um, this is, I think, one of the very fundamental things that we really, as Roman historians, struggle with, because in a way, um, in the short term, Roman slavery is incredibly brutal. Um, there are slaves who are literally sent into conditions where they are supposed to die, um, they are not supposed to survive for more than a year or two. If you're a slave who's sent to the mines, for example, you're supposed to die. And Romans were okay with this. But the other thing that Romans do that is quite interesting um, is the short-term conditions of Roman slavery are horrible, deliberately so. Um, but the long-term conditions of Roman slavery actually are, are different from how we imagine because Romans routinely freed their slaves and Roman slaves who were freed become Roman citizens. And the sons of Roman slaves who are freed become senators in some cases. And so in the short term, Roman slavery is, is worse, I think, than anything that we really could, I, could imagine, um, because it is something that totally devalues human life in a really horrible fashion. 
but also there is this other weird dynamic that makes it really hard for us to, to sort of pro appropriately uh, understand the moral implications of this system. Because you also have this long game that Romans play where slaves become integrated into Roman society in a complete way. And the descendants of those slaves very quickly become integrated into the highest levels of Roman society. Um, and so, you know, for me, this is very challenging and it's very challenging to, to talk about this to students um, because these two aspects really don't seem to make a lot of sense with each other. Uh, and, and I think that's really something that we in a modern context, um, we really need to, to str struggle to articulate both the horrors of Roman slavery and the weird kind of ability of Roman society to incorporate people who once had that status fully and completely into every aspect of the society itself. What got you interested in studying the history of Rome and what is the biggest misconception do you think there is out there about this period? Wow, those are great questions. <laughs> um, I think that the uh, the sort of siren song of Rome is that there's so much of Rome that you can go and 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 experience and touch and interact with, and there is this this feeling. And Romans had this too. I mean, there's a great passage in um, Seneca who's writing under the Emperor Nero who talks about how he liked to go to a bathhouse that Scipio Africanus built, a bathhouse that is 300 years old. And he said, I like to go into that bathhouse because I feel like I can sit in water that was once warmed by Scipio or Cato or Fabius. There's this sense among Romans always that the past is alive in Rome. And it's not just alive, but you can interact with it. You know, it, it's, it's there for you to experience. And, and if you can only understand it, there's some sort of deeper awareness of your own condition and your own kind of human experience that you can then acquire. And I, I succumb to that. Um, I love going to these sites. And trying to understand the reality of them and, and you know, understand how they were created. But I think one of the greatest misconceptions grows out of that same mystery, right? I mean, we, because we can do this, because there's so much of the Roman world that we can interact with, we feel like it is more immediate than it actually is. And I think the slavery question is a great way to look at that, right? Roman society in some ways, because it feels so tangibly close to us, it feels very close to our society. But there are basic assumptions about the Roman world um, that when we do that, we kind of allied. I mean, I don't think any of us would, would, we struggle intellectually to identify with a society that can devalue human life in the way that the Roman society did. Um, it's so different from the way we think about things um, that when we kind of do this communing with the Roman space, we miss some of those aspects of the Roman space that were horrifying. Um, we miss how Romans treated other human beings. Um, we miss how Romans were perfectly comfortable saying that the life of someone doesn't matter because of their legal status. Uh, and so I think that's one of the great misconceptions we have is there is a lot we can do and learn from Rome, but we have to be careful. We have to be careful that the lessons we're taking away are lessons that are actually applicable and not fall into the trap of assuming that Roman society is entirely like our own. Uh, and that's a real struggle that I think everyone interacting with Rome really, really undergoes. And that's a good lead into the final question to, to end where we began with the implications for today. Given the parallels in the differences, are you optimistic that we can avoid the fate of Rome or are you pessimistic? Um, I was, more optimistic. I have been more optimistic in the past, um, but I am still optimistic to a degree. I think it's important for us to acknowledge what we're dealing, you know, what, what we're dealing with, which is a crisis in the United States that is not four years old, um, but also a crisis in the United States that's not going to end in four years one way or the other. Uh, and so that means both that we have to look at more systemic problems in the United States, both in how we treat each other, but also in how our democracy works. Um, and we also can be aware um, that we have time to do this. You know, we, we do have the opportunity to engage these challenges, uh, think creatively about how to resolve them, but we also need to be respectful of the institutions that we have. Um, and I think one of the challenges when we see a crisis as an acute crisis, 
we are inclined to do away with some of the institutions that move slowly because we think the problem is immediate and requires a very dramatic solution or there won't be a solution at all. Um, this is how Romans thought. And those uh, expedient choices, uh, those decisions to move quickly to do something that um, seemed like it needed to be done at exactly that moment, under they undermined the structures of the Republic and they made it ultimately so that the Republic couldn't perform its basic function. And the basic function of a Republic is to make sure that all citizens voices are heard and all citizens rights are protected by law. Uh, and if the institutions of a Republic are not strong enough to do that, then people will choose something else that is stronger and is able to do that. I think that's the long-term lesson that Rome provides. We have time to do this. I'm optimistic that if we really confront the problems we face, we can solve them, but we also have to be protective of those structures because those structures serve a function and they serve a purpose. And that purpose is to protect us all, to make sure our rights are, are secure and our laws bind everybody. Uh, and that ultimately is a purpose I think we all need to keep in mind um, to protect the institutions and be patient so those institutions can hopefully solve the problems that we're facing. Well, on that wonderful and hopeful note, Ed, we are all in your debt for being with us this morning, especially from California. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> much. And we look forward to keeping in touch with you. All best wishes. Absolutely. Thank you, Clark. I really appreciate it. And, and thank you all for the great questions. Thank you.